This episode brought to you by Brass Ring Brewery. And stay frosty, Grand Rapids. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Garage Gym PT Podcast. Uh, sitting with you, as always, is David Forrest and Luke Polenkamp. Yeah, welcome back, guys. Good to be here. Uh, David and I are not recording back in Dayton and uh, Cincinnati today. Actually, in fact, we are up in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, enjoying the tasty brews of Brass Ring. Yeah, very unique uh, pub ale style place. So if you hear some background noise or somebody requests another beer, that that's what's up. That would be me, which it is absolutely delicious. Uh, no, guys, but we hope you guys enjoyed our last discussion on upper back strength. Uh, today, what Dave and I are going to do is discuss red flag physical therapists. Um, you might know these therapists as uh, dogmatic, where it's one way or the highway. They prey on the fears of their patients in order to make um, dollars, as opposed to having a conversation and actually relating the goals. Well, I mean, there's a few different ways to look at this, but... It works like a guru mentality that doesn't follow science. Yeah, and it's like prescribing to a specific school of thought without bending or relenting. Exactly. The dogma. The dogma. I think that in, in the world that we live in today, we have to be fluid with the ever-renewing wealth of information provided to us. But with the ever-flowing information, you know, with the constant changing and research and data and you know, changes in evidence-based practice. We can't always be set in the 1980s where spinal flexion is the devil. We need to be smarter than that, folks. We need to be smarter than that. Yeah, guys, sometimes the old ways are best, but if you're not willing to bend your opinion based upon new evidence, this is a definitely what I call a red flag. Um, but I guess, like, let's kind of just go through, like, some of, like, the general archetypes or the 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 patterns, I guess, that you see from certain people that are definitely red flags. I guess to start and lead it off, one of the most prolific therapists out there right now, you can look at Squat University. Um, She has just a very systematic and similar approach to every single person who watches Squat. Um, You'll notice that he does some form of hip internal or hip external rotation test, blames it immediately on that, um, and will basically put his explanation into a science that has been outdated and has been not necessarily consistent with the regressions and evidence-based practice. Um, I may even call this like a uh, like a system therapist, where it's a use my system to get better, mm-hmm. uh, selling like one product or something similar to a large number of people. So anytime that you guys see this type of like a uh, person, this is inherently meant to make money through a massive quantity of people uh, the inherent downfalls of it are there's no personalization there's extrapolation forward based upon what he's seen with other people and it kind of just glumps that clumps you into a uh, a larger mass of people and while that's good it's also not individual exactly I'm trying to think he, he might also be described as like a quick fix type of therapist too where he'll do a bunch of test retests to show you that it got better in one session yep and that's also why you need to look at what he he will use and back up and what he says is like more modern science but if you look at who is you know publishing and putting out his predatory journals that are actually publicizing his work so not necessarily credible resources in my opinion um it's like even when you get down to like the basics of the the intercession uh, dynamics, right? Yeah. So if you do like your test retest, it really doesn't matter what you do after you retest somebody. The fact that you did anything for them is going to yield a positive result because they think that something's being done. Correct. So if you get somebody out of a car and you test hip internal and external rotation, it's going to be tight by nature of them being in a car, not because you did something positive to affect being. Correct. Technique or mulligan techniques for like treating the spine are kind of meant to downregulate pain for the average everyday person, and they won't necessarily translate to doing 
deadlift, right? So like one of these techniques that you think has been the Kenzie method is uh, bird, bird dogging out of back pain. Mm -hmm. How is that going to translate to you doing a three or 400, 500 plus pound deadlift? All right, like alternating your extremities to just get your low back to fire. Great. Great for re-education at the beginning, but then what? Then the recruiting is really not. So, you know, there's multiple schools of thought on how to treat and create change in the human body. You have that person who says the fairway is the highway. It may be time to reassess. Um, I like to have students who approach things from multiple angles, not just simply one school of thought. Again, makes you a better, well-rounded clinician. I also think it makes you more open to conversation instead of planting your feet in the sand and saying, this is where I stand on everything. Because in all honesty, everything is constantly changing and having a wide base of getting all the information to even make your own opinion makes you a better clinician. Yeah, and even like blending with this a little bit is probably the person who uh, shits on others' ideas because they're different from their own. This would obviously kind of lead you to believe that they're a little bit closed-minded. So, like, once again, if you are kind of stuck in a rut and, like, you're just doing things one way and that you can't even embrace the possibility that somebody else may have the right way, this is definitely a red flag. Um, through continuing education and all that stuff, like, you should always believe that you're the least wrong that you've ever been but that you're not right. So you should kind of view science as like we are up to date to the most point that we are the least wrong in this point of history, not that we're the most right. Yep. This kind of leaves the door open for change, and it'll help kind of keep you fresh. Especially as better evidence presents itself. Um, I mean, heck, for the longest time, um, how often did you hear that lifting with a rounded spine was an absolute atrocity to the spinal? You know, health overall. And now people are finding that lifting with a, a, flex, a small amount of flexion into the spine is actually tolerable, if not more efficient, with sure. heavier loads. So I think you can use like the example of like overhead athletes or baseball players in the past. Like it's it's not something that you could do to uh, lift lift weights overhead. And like now it's kind of showing that like lifting weights from multiple planes and increasing the stability of the shoulder is probably what's best for the overhead athlete. Period. Whether you want to perform throwing, whether you want to perform foot jerks, whether you want to perform whatever, lifting in multiple planes and taxing your fist in a different way is exactly what you want to do for for longevity, uh, novelty, variation, etc. Right. Resilience through exposure, folks. Resilience through exposure. Um. I'm trying to think. Another archetype that's like Definitely a red flag is probably the person that is underloading, which we have chronically across the profession. So once again, you know, let's let's extrapolate this uh, this low back example, yeah. meaning the person who is coming from deadlifting four, five hundred pounds, squatting three, four, five hundred pounds on their back, they have back pain. You come in the first day, and they have you do clamshells, which are exactly away from your back. This is this is probably an idea that they don't really know what they're doing. And I mean, it may be good for like the first session or whatever, like where you're maybe getting some blood flow, you're kind of touchy, but then if that person is having you do that, you know, two or three weeks within, it's, it's not going to be enough. And like there's multiple, multiple, multiple studies that kind of, absolutely shit on us for underloading the tissues and that we really don't have a good idea from therapist to therapist as to like what an adequate load is for people to uh, be exposed to to create change. Especially like if you were to go back like what, maybe think like maybe five, ten years ago, if you were to go to look at some of the research where ACL loading, like they would have looked at you and you would have been like, hey, I wanted to load this person and I could say five, six weeks out. I really don't even know where the line in the sand is. I, I think a lot of us figured out that protocols were full of crap. Um, 
damn, here's another one. Uh, the protocol therapist. All right, so the six every single week. The person who is going through your post-op or even using like a dry needling protocol or whatever, like this is kind of similar to the message person who like they're not embracing their own thoughts. They're not treating you as an individual. You are just following the guidelines of uh, some random arbitrary protocol. Doing good. Thanks, Jim. And I correct me if I'm wrong, but like I, I think that those protocols were actually developed by athletic trainers for like post op ACL rotator cuff. Yep. I know some of them are athletic trainer based, and then some of them are also orthopedic surgeon based. Um, Neither of which treat them long term. Yeah, these people are going to be seeing them. In hindsight, you might get like a five minute session at a six week follow up three months follow up and then again maybe at six months um so meanwhile we're on this topic guys the reason that you're modified weight bearing or non-weight bearing or partial weight bearing or whatever the precaution might be for four to six weeks is because that's accepted as a soft tissue healing time frame and it has nothing to do with how much weight you can actually bear but the catch-22 to this is that you need the stress of weight to create the soft tissue healing There's us. I mean, we could dive in on protocols in a whole another episode if we really wanted to. But yeah, just kind of going back to the original point of you have the therapist who lives and dies by the protocol, and that's why you know you have to have that open discussion if available with the surgeon about why maybe you want to make those progressions or early advances in the protocol if warranted. Um, so I mean, there's a few different things to kind of think into this. Is that like maybe I have someone who I mean we're basically just pedaling our wheels when they could be doing something way more beneficial at the time frame of which they have with the therapist. Um, and I have a gentleman right now who's absolutely killing it on his shoulder rehab. Uh, I think he could advance to the next phase of rehab, but because it says no advancing without surgical uh, or surgeon, um, I, I guess, approval, I've been calling the surgeon probably two or three times last week, and I haven't even gotten a phone call back. So, I mean, like at that point, it's like now I'm just pedaling my wheels. When he could be advancing, we're just wasting time. Yeah, and that's a weird one, especially if the person has good tissue quality because you can send them back and they can look great and that person may or may not be mad that you did it. So it's just very weird. Yeah. It's very annoying when you're you're being held up by the fact that someone won't return a phone call. So, uh, I mean, I understand you're busy, but at the end of the day, we're all busy. Got to do better as a whole. I think. How about the PT that has way too many letters behind their name? You mean me? <laughs> I mean, like, plus, uh, plus, like, five or six certifications. Yeah. That, like, boast this, like, huge scholastic background. Yeah. Uh, but also have missed out on years of clinical experience. Yeah. And not progress themselves as an actual clinician. Yeah. Instead of actually spending time in the clinic, they're just a book jockey. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like when all you want is just some more letters behind your name, you got to look at it as are you trying to help people or are you trying to advance their career? And I think sometimes when people kind of get into the wheelhouse of I want to get as many letters behind my name as possible, um, just to advance my credibility, I mean, you got to look at it. Well, I think there's like a numerator of problems with that one. One, you have less time in the clinic. Two, you have less time practicing what you preach from especially like a sports medicine perspective because if, if, if they're not in the clinic and they're at various courses studying all the time, you know, putting in 50, 60 hour weeks, they're also not working out. They're not doing any of this other stuff. So, I mean, that kind of blends itself with like getting the therapist that doesn't like to practice what they preach. So it's like, once again, if you're not actually getting experience in the situation, like you're, you're probably not qualified to treat that, that patient population. You know, like how many people are trying to like treat CrossFitters or powerlifters or weightlifters and they have no idea about the programming that comes with it and where the actual breakdown is. I think 
that, that, that's actually making a very good point of the people who will claim to be physical therapists who um, work with that type of patient population, but in reality, doesn't understand the programming that goes into that, doesn't understand the weight of loading, doesn't understand the progression of like, or like maybe even like what ranges to maybe modify into, but yet they'll sit there and make these changes to your therapy program. And so right. you're just going to be okay, but yet you can continue to have problems. Kind of arbitrarily. I mean, I, I've been involved in this like in a multitude of reasons. Uh, I used to practice at a place where I was like an actual throwing therapist, like treating a bunch of baseball players, and the actual throwing therapist hadn't played baseball past, I don't know, 10 years old. Oh, so they had no idea of the demands of the season, the actual throwing motion, the mechanics involved. I mean, they were treating like college, minor league, even pro level baseball players with no appreciation for the demands of the actual act of throwing. Or like where the breakdown occurs, the actual soreness that you feel, the repetition involved, it was just a huge disconnect. Well, I can think I have a good background in throwing, but I'm not going to claim to be an expert in throwing mechanics. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a point to admitting some of this stuff too. Yeah. And like I have no trouble, you know, whenever somebody comes in and they like have reached a plateau and I'm like, well, maybe I'm not the person for you and like you can go talk to X, Y, and Z. They have a much better understanding and that's, that's fine to check the ego, uh, but I'm not going to milk them for visits and money. Yeah. If I'm going to do a throwing program with someone, so if I'm going to be doing a particular like session on their throwing mechanics, I'm going to look at what maybe we can change in the moment, like volume wise, just look at the program wise and see what we can kind of reduce and make those changes. Um, like at a younger baseball player right now, we don't have any way to run the program on him. Um, but then I've been losing this up to his, uh, his actual baseball coaches on monitoring him through the range that I've allowed. Uh, it's been a good little tandem. I mean, like I've, I've kind of defaulted and given a little bit more I guess insight from the, the throwing coaches and what they've been seeing, what I've been seeing. Um, and actually, they, they've been able to progress back to pitching uh, multiple games in a week in the national um, with adequate rest time since he's been out. Um, but I think when you are going to sit there and tell someone who has a way more experience in a particular field um, how to do it, like I'm not going to tell him how to throw, but I'm going to look at where maybe he's weak at and maybe see how that correlates. Yeah, and maybe this is even like another subset of things. The person who spends too much time going over technique in the clinic and not making the most of your time, they're kind of wasting their your session here. So like, if you like want to go through and like break down like running mechanics on like the alter G, or if you want to go through a throwing motion and go through a throwing program, or if you want to like look over power clean, it's like why are we spending our time doing this when none of us are actually certified to do it and have not coached anybody through this. Like, just because you have a doctor's degree that somebody arbitrarily gave you, if you pass a test, does not make you qualified to then give advice biomechanically to any of these people, no matter what you might think. I think the number one thing is when you've had a therapist who's never power cleaned a day in their life and is all of a sudden trying to fix the mechanics of a power clean. Right, claiming that they know more than, like, David and... Uh, Sorry, Jared and Amy Everett. Like, you just don't. Sorry. That drives me to the wall. Um, I think, who else did we bring up when we red flag therapists for this? The red flag movement. Uh, how about the catchy exercise group? Oh, the, this, this single exercise fixed all my pain. Or this program fixed all my pain. Or it's just the thing that they use for the attention grabbing on, on like the social media app here. Yeah. If that has minimal application to the to the actual activity. I think when people try to sell it as a one program fixes all, that is a big red flag. Um, and I mean, I we can name a few people. Um, Alan Muse over those guys, but his program fixed anyone's knee pain. 
Right, or if it's gadgety, or if it's requiring you to buy something to complete the exercise. At least Tourette and his mobility package program. Right, or how you have to buy his voodoo floss. The same thing with, like, the music with Toe's guy where he sells the blocks and, like, all of all of that type of stuff. It's kind of... It's in the program. They're trying to mimic with, like, the program people. Um, or even just, like, you know, the, the attention grabbers on... On your net. Mm. One size fits all, man. That is no bueno. Not a fan. One size does not fit all. I'll say that right now. That's why we have the whole process of individualization. Um, individualization and um, specificity for creating a plan of care. Folks. I got one. The. Uh, Therapist who uses too much jargon, <laughs> or the person who can't explain a complex concept with five cent words and they choose to use five dollar words. These guys You're are gonna have to repeat all that. I don't think we got any of that. All right, well, some bikes just kind of came by. Moped. Dirt bikes go by. So I said the uh. The therapist who uses jargon or large words to confuse a patient into making the problem seem more complex than it is. This guy's a problem or this girl's a problem from a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. Is they create complexity in order to get you to stay for more visits to make you think that your problem is something that it's not. And then they use large words to basically create confusion. And once again, try to draw reliance on themselves rather than providing a solution or a path out. So they make you think that they are so smart that they have the only way out when, in fact, they may not even understand the problem at the base itself. Or if they can never really be in solution to what they feel to be going on. Or maybe are. Honestly, I hate it when people don't necessarily relay to the layman what necessarily is happening. Uh, that's actually why I like to talk about prevention in a way that everyone understands, as opposed to confusing the absolute daylights out of the patient, thinking that it is something absolutely horrible that is going on uh, with these big fancy words that we use. Sometimes, oh man, uh, the message gets lost in the big fancy words, and panic sets in, and there is no hope. Um, there just needs to be a little bit more relay to folks that they can actually start making progress if presented in a way which is understandable. Yep, you know, 100. Just pisses me off when you sit there and try to act all smart and fancy with these big words where, yes, you can present this if you were in the right audience in those manners, and that's fine. Well, you're not going to present it academically to somebody who's not in academia. Exactly. Like, you have to make it pretty black and white for them. And, I mean, there are shades of gray with this, but also explain that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, making a problem simple doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be an easy way out. Uh, okay. We're kind of digging here. Um how about the therapist who says you have to do your exercises every day, multiple times a day? Otherwise, no progress will be made. Yeah, big, 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 big red flag as you're violating the basic physiology of exercise uh, and strength and conditioning on the recovery curve here. And by the way, if you can do this stuff two to three times a day, it's not intense enough. So like, if you don't go and leave physical therapy, and you're not sore, then it, there's a there's an inherent problem here. You're not making any type of finite changes. You're not changing the tissue. You're not changing your position. You're not changing your nervous system. You're doing nothing to improve yourself, and you're kind of spinning your wheels and getting weaker in the process because you're removing yourself from your goal for a further period of time. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that soreness is like the one thing that dictated it does promote the fact that there was potential damage to the 
Yeah. Or, Soreness might not be the right word, yeah. but you definitely need to feel systemic fatigue. Yeah. I mean, a rate of change. What is what is what is your, I guess, perceived rate of improvement? What is your symptom? What is your perceived progress? That I think is like whatever is your goal. I guess if you want to be less sore with exercise, cool. You're less sore. If you want to have less pain with exercise, cool. You have less pain. Um, but, regardless. And maybe on the other side of this too is the guy who overloads people and is having you do. 10, 12, 15 different exercises and <laughs> not making, you know, any, any cuts to the, to the list of volume. 10 parts to an ATP. So then you're spending, I don't know, two hours rolling through PT exercises. Like, that's not sustainable. Yeah. I mean, if you're a big PT program, like, anything else you want to hit on here? Dave? Let's go in the depths of the old brain here. Who else don't I like? Of the old brain. Oh, uh, what about um, who have you? He's a Cairo. Is he really? I thought he was a PT. Yeah, yeah he's actually a Cairo. Well, he's not a recent PT. Yeah. Huh. So that's that's his main discussion, I guess. Wow, did not know that. Uh, maybe like the obviously burnout therapist. <laughs> this does not give a flying. About what goes on in there. Yeah, this one might be the most obvious out of all of them. Me, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not burnout. I have dire and passion for my patients. It gets good on a daily basis. I don't think I have enough caffeine in my system. But yeah, I found out this guy's just like obviously always double booked and you know, doesn't really have any like time to themselves. Or it's, I don't know. It's obvious when you see it because they just can't wait for you to get off of the table, and they're always constantly looking at computers, and are constantly reminded of numbers by their upper brain. Yeah, there's multifactorial there, but this this person might be the most obvious out of all of them to spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it's much more of like a system problem than it is like a personal problem, and it just might mean that you're in the wrong spot, period. Very true. I can't think of anything else to talk about on the red flag therapist. I don't know. I think we covered it from like an in person perspective. I mean, the social media aspect is a completely different thing. Yeah, that's I mean, we touched on it a little bit, but um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's something further to talk about in the future. Yeah. In the meantime, I hope you guys enjoyed this discussion from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, we will see you guys next episode. See you soon. Bye-bye.